Hi, my name is Isan Taylor with I Love the Berg, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our next installment of the History Half Hour. These free history tours are made possible in part by the city of St. Petersburg. We're about to get started with today's host, Monica Kyle, who's live at the pink streets of Greater Pinellas Point. Her husband, John Kyle, will be running the slideshow for us today. Today, you'll see a mix of live footage and slides with historic photos. We hope you enjoy. If you have a question during our live tour, please feel free to use the comments section. We'll do our best to work in as many questions during the live tour as possible. Once again, thank you for joining us. Be sure to follow I Love the Berg on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as subscribing to our newsletter to stay up to date on our next history tour, the latest news, exclusive deals, and all things good in the Berg. And with that, Monica, I'm gonna head over to you. All right, and you can hear me? You unmuted me yes. now? Okay. Yes, we're gonna go. Uh, Thank you, Isa. Welcome everybody to the next installment of the History Half Hour. I am standing on 14th Street in a neighborhood known as the Pink Streets, which is really a neighborhood within a neighborhood, the, the larger neighborhood being Greater Pinellas Point. And I want to say thank you to the Greater Pinellas Point Civic Association and Jerry Lemke in particular, um, who's a historian that, that helped me out with a lot of our, uh, my research during this tour. So this is really a very unique, and I have to say, I think I say this every time I research a new neighborhood, but this might be the most interesting neighborhood. Um, maybe most intriguing would be the right word. We really came across some great stories that we'll be sharing with you today. But before we get started, I want to give you a sense of where we are. So John, if you'll throw up those maps and kind of give people a sense of where I'm located right now. Yeah. Um, first is a satellite image of St. Petersburg uh, with downtown kind of at the top. And then the big circle is what we are referring to as Greater Pinellas Point. Um, if I drill down just a little bit, um, you'll see a big star. That's kind of where Monica is standing, where um, 14th Street kind of ends down there um, near the waterfront. And then if I get even closer, this is the uh, pink streets, these kind of curving, um, winding streets that are below Pinellas Point Drive that have a distinct color. And Monica is going to start um, over here where the star is and work her way south to Catherine Bell Tippett's Park and Pinellas Point Park. And we'll talk about her, the home, and uh, the park. She's going to make her way up through the neighborhood to an Indian mound that is up there. And then make her way back around to one of the first homes uh, that is a castle with an interesting history so that gives you a sense of the, the area that Monica is going to be covering on foot today. Yes. Thank you, John. And uh, hi. Um, you mentioned Bay Vista Park, and it's an interesting place to start because that's the area that really gave um, our county in this peninsula its name. Where Bay Vista Park is today, there used to be a large pine forest that probably stretched, frankly, all the way to where we are now. And a ship's captain, a Spanish uh, pilot, actually, of a Spanish fleet in the 1700s, named the area Punta de Pinal de Jimenez. So Point of Pines of Jimenez, who Jimenez was his boat captain or his ship's captain. So the Punta de Pinal part stuck, and it became known as Point Pinellas. And then they ended up taking that for the county name, and this area became Greater Pinellas Point. Uh, the Pink Streets neighborhood Originally, this area was inhabited by Tocobaga Indians. We'll talk more about them a little later in the tour. There was some Seminole activity after the Tocobagas were decimated by um, disease and, and warfare. Some pioneer activity. Um, nothing really, no modern development here until the area is bought by a woman named Marguerite Cook in 1906. She buys most of the area now known as the Pink Street but doesn't develop it for another 20 years. Now you have to remember this is seven miles away from what we know as downtown St. Pete. So it's quite a distance to get down here. There's really not good roads. It's wild down here. So she's just kind of holding this land until the real estate boom of the 1920s. And at that point, she and her son form a development company they call Murrock Realty, M-U-R-O-K. And we think that name came from a combination of her maiden name, which was Marat, and her married name, which was Cook. So they call it Murrock Realty. And like every other real estate promoter in the area, they start pushing 
Pinellas Point as being the, you know, the, the healthiest spot on earth and, a, you know, a place of leisure and relaxation and great beauty. Now, everybody in Florida is, is selling real estate at this point to, you know, northerners up, up north who don't really have any idea of what they're buying. And in fact, much of the land that they were promoting in what they call the Pinellas Point edition was in fact underwater. So they proposed a large section of dredge and fill. And in fact, at the end of where I am, 14th Street, they call this the concourse. And as you can tell, it really is quite grand with this sort of trees shading the middle. Um, at the end of this, there was going to be dredged in a large island, which was proposed to have a hotel and casino. Um, John, do you want to pull up those pictures that we have we have some of um some brochures of promoting the pinellas point edition it wasn't later in, that it, until later that it became known as the pink streets but john show that one of where the proposed all the area that they were planning on building i think it was 140 additional acres they were planning on yes 140 yeah. additional acres of new land that they were going to add with some deep lagoons and canals i think one of those ads shows uh yeah, canals on there go ahead We've got an ad up here showing yeah, the, the extent of the canals that they wanted to build. And I'm going to zero in on that a little bit closer so you can just see this really where Monica is standing is kind of down in this area uh, around here. If you can see my arrow, I'm not sure. Um, and um, and there was this huge sort of section that they were going to have canals and connections and finger, you know, uh, properties kind of formed the shape of a skull really impossible to imagine that they didn't start to notice that and do that intentionally um they got the permission to dredge and fill um and they didn't get very far this next diagram shows sort of the limitation of where the land is today this this red section and all that below it is, is what never was realized and most of these streets down at the very tip of this red section um never never got uh got filled in so the market collapsed sort of halted that expansion and this last slide just kind of shows the fanfare that went with the paving of pinellas point drive because before that it was really difficult to get down there and pinellas point drive really opened it up to get people down there to look at property well and john that article also notes that the streets here were paved with concrete, which was a big deal. These were the first streets to be paved with concrete. So prior to that, we've been paving our streets in brick and shell, where the shell came from, we'll talk about in a few moments. But George Cook really wanted to set himself apart. You know, everyone was selling real estate, so you wanted to do whatever you could to make yourself different, your development different. So George Cook, not only did he use concrete, but he tinted the concrete pink using hematite, which is an iron oxide compound, basically. Um, and he said that this would reduce the glare and the heat absorption. It would make the neighborhood cooler. And, you know, the idea of having pink streets um, was then and still is today very charming. In fact, the, the concrete sheets, well, they were done in one large pour originally, which is kind of amazing. You think about it. And actually, even the curbs are pink concrete. And we're going to get Andrew to show you that in just a minute. But they were done originally in one big, lar long, uh, continuous pour. They held up pretty well um, till about the 80s. We start seeing lots of potholes and ruts, and it starts becoming a topic of discussion. These, hit, these roads are going to need to be repaved. But what are we going to do? Are we going to pave them in asphalt? We're going to lose our pink streets? How, how are we going to deal with that? So there's a ton of articles and editorials in the paper in the 80s about what we're going to do about the pink streets in Pinellas Point. The neighbors obviously want to keep their charming pink streets. It's going to cost almost double to pave the streets again in pink concrete versus black asphalt that was used throughout the rest of the city. Now, a lot of the neighbors said, yeah, but we didn't get our streets paved for 60 years, so we're due. Uh, so it went back and forth for like six years, and they finally did repave the streets using a pink concrete. The residents of the neighborhood, if you lived on a pink street, were assessed um, the difference. Please call me, I've got my phone up. Were assessed the um, difference in the cost between the asphalt and the pink concrete. So over the years, they've, and Andrew, I want you to get you to kind of film some of the road here. Over the years, since the 90s, now you can see was, this is not done in one um, continuous pour like it was originally. You can see where the dividers were for the concrete. But now they haven't been repaved since the 90s, but they do patch them occasionally. And you can see, depending on which, contract, which contractor and what time, 
that, you know, the pink is a little bit different. This one's clearly been painted. So the patchwork jobs, you know, they don't all match, but as a whole, and especially if you look at pictures from above, we really do maintain the pink streets. And now it's sort of this uh, beloved thing in St. Pete. I don't think anybody would dream of paving them over in black asphalt. I want to talk about the house behind me. It's one of the landmarks of the neighborhood. Andrew and I just met the owner actually just a few moments ago, and he was delightful and was telling us about the renovation work they've been doing. Um, this house was built in 1925 by a woman named Catherine Bell Tippett. She's really one of the most remarkable women in St. Pete and should be more famous than she is probably. I'm going to tell you about her in just a moment. But she had this house built. Now, it originally, she owned all the land down to the water. There's a house behind it now. I just learned from the homeowner that that house was put in in the 50s. So she originally had this. She had a, a splendid garden behind it that attracted all kinds of wildlife. The, the surrounds around the doors and the windows is actually quite coral that was brought in from the keys. There's also a, a coral rock fireplace inside. John, go ahead and show those pictures um, of the house when it was first built in the 1920s and then the, the fireplace as well. And then I want, to sh I want you to show that um, aerial photo too, John, so you can get some perspective on you know, when she owned the land all the way down to the water, what drew her to this area? And we're gonna talk about Catherine Bell Tippett in just a minute, but what drew her was this proximity to the water and the wildlife that came along with that. And we'll learn more about that in just a moment. But as John and I walk down to Catherine Bell Tippett's park, I want him to tell you about the subsequent or some of the subsequent owners that lived in this house that's um, just been undergoing a beautiful renovation now. So John, as we walk down there, why don't you tell them about the next sort of infamous residence? <laughs> yeah, um, I will mention first that if you're having any trouble at home with the video, it's limited by our cell service down there. It's, it's coming through pretty good, but every once in a while it has to catch up. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna do my best to tell this story. It's sort of the precursor to the Tiger King and some current residents might remember um, some people that lived there um, who were tiger tamers. Um, a couple whose stage names were Ron and Joy Holiday were dancers um, who met as children um, in dance school up in Maine. And they had successful dance careers, um, but then distinguished their act by bringing in tigers in the most Florida way, right? Um, they toured the country, the cat dancers, and in their downtime lived in what was the Catherine Bell Tibbetts home. And uh, when they were home, they would practice their act in their backyard with their tigers to the delight of neighborhood kids who would come down on Sunday afternoons and watch. Uh, there were neighbors who, you know, complained and thought maybe not the safest thing to live with uh, live tigers in the neighborhood. But they were so popular in the neighborhood that when this was brought to the city, there was such an outcry of support for them that they were allowed to continue to live there, even though I don't know if we have a zoning area for uh, wild animals like that. Um, the story does take a tragic turn. They, they moved to Gainesville area to get a little more um, space. They had a trainer who also lived and worked with them who was like family to them and I, one day the trainer and this is in the mid 80s the trainer was attacked and killed by one of the tigers in here and, and this sent them into a depression that just six weeks later joy holiday was attacked by the same tiger that tiger had to be put down and it was really kind of like this remarkable story um that hbo made a documentary in uh, 2007 or 2009 somewhere around there called the cat dancers. So we had our own St. Pete version of the Tiger King. Um, needless to say, what Monica is about to tell you about Catherine Bell Tibbetts, she had a very different relationship with animals. Uh, back to me, John? Back to you. <laughs> yeah, back to me. Uh, I have to tell you, the owner of the Catherine Bell Tippett's house now said, we absolutely have to watch The Cat Dancer, um, that it's a great story. So um, we are now in Catherine Bell Tippett's park which is a portion of a park that was already existing, but they renamed this portion of it for Catherine Bell Tibbetts in 2009. And I want just for a second, Andrew, to follow me over here so you can get a glimpse of the view. I don't know if you'll be able to um, see the Skyway Bridge in the way that we can, because sometimes the, the camera can't pick it up with the light differentials. John, can you guys see the Skyway there? I've lost John, not, John not you there? Quite. 
there. Not quite. No, not quite. Okay, well, oh, yeah. Sorry. Trust me, I muted yeah. myself, you know. And, and yeah. So, yeah. The Skyway is right there. So just trust me. So um, we're actually going to walk through the park as I talk a little bit about Catherine Bell Tippett. Um, she was really a fascinating. Oh, wait, I got your Tiger King notes here. Hold on. Um, Catherine Bell Tippett was born just for the end of the Civil War in Maryland and lived on a plantation in Maryland. Um, was very well educated, spoke four languages, ends up marrying a journalist and traveling the world with her journalist husband. Uh, they come to Florida like many people did in the early 1900s for the, her husband's health. He's sickly. And they buy a hotel that was called the Lakeview Hotel. And John, we have some pictures of that on Central Avenue at 6th Street, which is just where Mirror Lake is. Uh, they buy the Lakeview Hotel. They rename it the Belmont after the plantation that she grew up on in Maryland. And the husband dies not too long after they move here to St. Pete. She, instead of, she continues to manage the Belmont Hotel for 50 years. But instead of remarrying, she throws herself into civic work. Um, and she becomes what the, the tourist news magazine calls the big, the, the big magazine in St. Pete during that time. She becomes the busiest woman in St. Pete. And, you know, this was an era where women couldn't have the careers, either political or business, that, that we can today. And so a lot of women would distinguish themselves through their service work, and it's particularly widowed or divorced women, which is what uh, Catherine Bell Tippett's was. So she starts the St. Petersburg Audubon Society because she's very concerned with the massacre of the plume birds, so the wading birds like roseate spoonbills and egrets, flamingos, who hunters were killing for their feathers to be used in hats and ladies' fashion. It was all the rage in the early 1900s. So the St. Petersburg Audubon Society becomes one of the leaders, actually, in the Audubon Society movement in Florida and helps pass all kinds of le legislation to put an end, to make it illegal to hunt these wading birds. Um, she's very successful. We have some photos of her. Um, she got a petition that was like 70 feet long to protect robins. Um, she started a bird sanctuary here in St. Petersburg. She becomes the president of the Florida Audubon Society, and she's responsible for naming the mockingbird as the state bird and the orange blossom as the state flower. So she was very uh, politically savvy and realized that a good way to get people to care about our wildlife was to get them invested in uh, you know, picking which bird most represents us and which flower most represents us. So she actually, with the Audubon Society, was responsible for starting that all over the country. So all, all of the states that have state birds and flowers, they owe that to Catherine Bell Tippett. So she wasn't just involved with the Audubon Society. She helped start the Boy Scouts here, the Campfire Girls. She was on the Board of Trade, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, just very involved and um, distinguished in St. Pete. She ends up buying this or building this house as part of the Pinellas Point Edition development in 1925. And she's really drawn here. Because now you can imagine this was all, this wasn't parkland, this was just undeveloped land. And so she's drawn to the birds and the wildlife and the nature that are here. Um, now it's parkland. And John, do you want to tell us? Uh, I should finish. Catherine Bell Tippett dies in, John, I think it was 1950 that she died. Yes. Um, and sort of really yeah. under recognized for what she did and accomplished. But they renamed part of the park here for her in 2009. And John, you'll talk about the founding of the rest of this park. An interesting story. Yeah, um, you know, prior to the park that Monica's walking through, which you can see is quite large, uh, there was a park down there, Bay Vista Park, which you mentioned earlier. That was the landing point for the Beeline Ferry, which was really a catalyst for the growth of this area because it was so remote. The Beeline Ferry, which opened in 1926, connected St. Petersburg with Bradenton, turning a 60-mile drive over the Ganey Bridge into a seven-mile boat ride. And so that brought a lot of people down to that area. So popular that cars would back up on the forestry for hours on busy days to get over the ferry. Um, and 
this next picture that I'm going to throw out there is interesting. Just to explain how popular it is, Monica's family, Monica and her family do not come from St. Petersburg. But this woman on the right in this picture is Monica's great grandmother, who spent her entire life in, in the, Pittsburgh. Yeah, in the picture. Um, but in some family pictures, uh, we found pictures of her riding the manatee uh, over to Bradenton. Great um, her great grandmother. Uh, taking the, the, the ferry over to Manatee uh, County. And that was, it was a very popular thing until the Skyway was built. Uh, the park, however, that Monica and Andrew are walking through right now came about in the 70s. So after the, the crash, there was all this kind of leftover undeveloped land and a, a man named Ed Wright bought up a lot of it. He was actually at one point the wealthiest man in St. Petersburg. He had over 50,000 acres of the county from San Key all the way down to the point there. And he died in 1969 and there was about 10 years of time when his properties were being liquidated and Pinellas Point started to become a popular place to build homes. And the neighbors down there were really afraid that uh, the, their, their water for our open waterfront, their views of the water were, were going to be, become a thing of, of the past. So a group of neighbors got together, bought the, um, bought the, about nine acres there with the intent to sell it to the city as a park. And which they did with the stipulation that they not build any ball fields or man-made uh, buildings or anything like that. So that's how it is today. The only thing being built there right now is fire ant mounds, and there are plenty of those. Um, they do cut the man, or they used to cut the mangoes back to keep the views, but now those are there to protect the neighborhood in storms. Um, but there are no picnic benches, or there are no restrooms, nothing else down there. Very little street parking. It's really kind of a quiet neighborhood park compared to the very busy boat ramps and playgrounds of Maximo Park and Bay Vista Park. Um, really just a very quiet neighborhood park um, that and, just stretches kind of along the waterfront there. Well, that and that, John, I don't know if you can see it, like, but, you know, we're still walking along this park and we kind of came to what looked like an end of the park. And then we sort of ducked around and then it opens back up and you can see these houses that are here. I mean, they basically have sort of private park and... Andrew, after you film that house, pan over to this side, and you can see how high up the mangroves have gotten. Those are all mangroves, and they um, are hugely protective in storms. I mean, I've, I've watched that little demonstration. They have a really neat little thing at the pier where it shows the difference of when waves come ashore in an area where there's mangroves versus one where there's not. And it makes a huge difference on the um, flooding of the area. So, you know, these mangroves used to be trimmed back a, like you were saying, John, for so that the homeowners could have a better view. The, the um, city was that's... actually once fined by the county for cutting them because, you know, somebody called and said, hey, I can't see. And the, and the city guys just came out and said, sure, we'll cut it. And, <laughs> and the county said, no, you're Which, not allowed to do that yeah. anymore. We've learned our lesson now, but it, you probably can't pick these up on the camera, but there's all kinds of butterflies and birds flying around here. We're actually, I, I took us a little bit on a detour. We're going to come out here onto, there's actually still a number of unpaved roads in the pink streets. So they're, you know, these are the gray streets, as you said the other day, John, we're about to come I, out. I actually, one Monica, the, I didn't tell you this. I found out the reason those, those streets are, are not paved is because certain areas why? did not want to pay the assessment to, uh, ah. to get their streets repaved in pink. And so they just oh. let them go. So. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, it looks like they had been paved at one point in like a regular asphalt. But um, yeah, yeah. so we're on Armistead Place and we're about to come out onto Demons. So Armistead was the name of um, one of our earliest mayors who happened to marry Sarah Williams, who was the wife of John Williams, who's the city founder. Um, and it, it, Armistead Street, I think we're on, Armistead Place connects or intersects here with Demons Drive. And Demons was one of the, Peter Demons was one of the founders along with John Williams of the city. So John, I thought it was really interesting that little tidbit you found about um, how these streets got their names. Do you have that quote handy? Yeah, the, the, one of the guys who was in charge of, uh, I think it was, it was George Cook who, who, who was developing the area, did not like all the, difficult to pronounce Spanish names that were popular in, in towns that were springing up in California. And so he just said, we're not going to have any of these, these difficult names. And he relayed this story about a, 
an actor who was getting Les Miserables produced. And someone said, I can't believe you found a manager who could produce Les Miserables. And he said, produce it. I couldn't find anybody who could pronounce it. Um, and so he wanted all the names to be Blossom and Neighbor and Home and then named after um, people in the area who we knew as opposed to all these really tough names that, that, that he felt like people weren't going to be able to pronounce. Yeah, so that's big. And you can still see a lot of those, you know, the streets still have those names today. As we walk to our next stop, Andrew will kind of you know, pan around and you can see a lot of these other houses here are 1950s sort of ranch style houses. And that's because, as you said, John, after the Pinellas Point addition uh, development went bust, which happened to many of the developments um, in Florida in the 1920s, the Cooks sold most of their land to Ed Wright, who was buying up, you know, just huge parcels of land all over the city. He eventually sells most of it to Rutenberg Realty, who develops most of these homes later in the 40s, 50s and on. Uh, but he doesn't sell the location of our next stop, which is the Pinellas Point Indian Mound. And John, you've been doing some research on Indian Mounds for something else you've been working on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the mound in general? And then when we get there, I'll tell the particular story about this Indian mound. Sure. Yeah, uh, I've been researching for an article that I'm that's going to be in the Northeast Journal if you read that one. But uh, there are Indian mounds, or used to be Indian mounds, all over St. Petersburg. Um, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was actually an effort to market St. Pete as the city of mounds. The name didn't stick in large part because a lot of our settlers and early developers found the material from the mounds to be really handy in filling in ruts from wagon wheels and later um, as sort of the basis for the city's first streets. So when you knock down the thing you're trying to name your city after, it doesn't really stay around <laughs> really until there was one major mound left, um, which was Mound Park, which uh, gave Mound Park Hospital its name. The other mounds being this one where Monica is heading and up in Wheaton Island, there was a, a mound complex. And they didn't really start to gain interest until there was just a few left. And in the 20s, and beyond the Smithsonian did some research on the Whedon Island mounds and the one that Monica is heading to there in the pink streets. The Mound Park mound was sort of always kind of climbed on and replenished and sort of um, added to over and over again that there wasn't really uh, much to, to consider original to the mound, although the middle of it, these were middens. These were trash mounds, for lack of a better word that were mostly just discarded shells and stuff. Um, although there's, there were some temple mounds and burial mounds up in the Whedon Island area. So the we the main, the, the Mound Park Mound uh, was knocked down in 1950 when the hospital expanded, really without a whole lot of discussion. Most of the mounds in the, in the city were leveled for their material and to get them out of the way without much fanfare. Um, and even that met that large one in Mound Park People kind of lamented it, but thought, you know, it's kind of ugly. No one comes here. You know, we need, we need to expand the hospital. And it was knocked out. So, um, but the one there in the pink streets um, survived. It's a little further than we expected it to be. I'm, I'm trying to vamp here. No, no, we're, we're just, we're, 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 you're stretching beautifully, close. John. We're, yeah, stretching yeah. beautifully. Uh, but I yeah, can so see the fence. You can see the fence. I mean, it's yeah. sitting there right amongst a bunch of homes. And then one of our sons, best friends uh, lives down the street there and, and they'd go over there and, and play on the mound, just, just, you know, in people's backyards. And then there are areas that you're not allowed to climb on and stuff, but it's, it's a really cool thing to have just right in the middle of this neighborhood uh, that got preserved. They, um, they, do, they do a good job of, um, cause even in the last couple of years since we've been coming here more frequently, they've, you can tell the areas that have been sort of trod on, more than others and they try to prevent that so they kind of close those paths and open up new ones so it's yeah, so the historians and, and their notice... families that, that keep tramping all over them yeah um notice we're walking on a shell path you know whenever i walk on a shell path in saint pete i'm always wondering if i'm wa walking on the uh discarded remnants of a of an indian midden and this one john was believed to be a temple mound um yeah and even, you know, the, the trash bins, as you said, reveal so much about, you know, what we know about how Native Americans lived, what they ate, um, you know, all kinds of things about their diet, how they lived. Um, so 
you can really learn a lot. It's really a shame that we lost so many of these mounds, but it's great that this one's preserved. If people want to come down here to this one, you can access it out the front from Pinellas Point Drive. And there's a great little interpretive exhibit right here that we're about to see. I'll have Andrew shoot that, some pictures of it real quick. Um, so the, the sign to the right there, Andrew, was put up in the 1960s by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Some of the wording may be a little bit dated, might be different than what, how we would say it today. Um, and then these two signs over here, particularly this middle one is really new and it's got some really fascinating information on how scientists discover what they know using LIDAR and kind of um, sensor, you know, sonar imaging is pretty fascinating. We're actually gonna walk up onto the top of the mound and I'm gonna tell you, you know, we titled this um, tour Princesses and Pink Streets. And one of the princesses that we're referring to is, is affiliated with this mound. Now she probably wasn't a princess. She was the daughter of a chief and kind of over time, we've given her the label of princess. But this was a Tokabaga Indian mound, probably a temple mound. There was actually a causeway, you know, a road that the um, archeologists have determined was here from here, kind of down to the road, not to the road, to the water. Um, when Narvaez, the Spanish explorer, landed on our shores in 1528, probably out in the jungle area, he made his way inland and he came upon the village of Usita, which historians and archeologists believe to be in this general area. It's pretty well documented that there was a, he came upon some Spanish boxes or casks that had probably washed ashore from a earlier shipwreck. The Native Americans were using those as um, makeshift coffins. Narvaez thought this was a sacrilege and he kind of fell upon the Indians and slaughtered them. He cut off the chief's nose. The chief was named Chief Hirihigua. He cut off his nose. He killed the chief's mother and fed him to, fed the mother to his war dogs. This is all Narvaez. And then he starts saying, you know, where, where's the gold? Where are the riches? That really is what he's looking for. And the quick thinking Native Americans say, Appalachia, pointing north to where the Appalachian Indians in the Tallahassee area are living. And Narvaez and his men go off on an overland expedition that's its whole other story. Some of Narvaez's men sailed back to Cuba. Narvaez's wife commissioned some of those men to later go back and look for Narvaez. So they come back and Chief Higua is sort of laying in wait for them. Two of the men get off. One of them is named Juan Ortiz. They get off their ship. They come ashore. Indians immediately kill the other man and they capture Juan Ortiz. Over the course of the next couple of days, he's tortured and eventually ends up being roasted on a spit above an open fire. And his screams of pain are overheard by the daughter of the chief, whose name they believe is Eulalie. So if any of you have been to the Tampa restaurant named Eulalie, that's uh, or it's either Eulalie or Eulala, that's who it's named after. Uh, she hears his cries of pain and comes and pleads with her father to please um, free him and rest, you know, don't kill him. The father listens. Uh, Juan Ortiz is saved. He actually becomes part of the tribe, learns the language and the languages of neighboring tribes. When the next Spanish expedition comes out of DeSoto, they stumble upon Juan Ortiz. He becomes a translator for them. He rejoins the Spanish explorers, goes off on to Soto's overland mission, which is very well documented. This is how we know the story of Juan Ortiz. And it's dying on that, on that mission. But that's how we know this story. It's documented in four different accounts. Um, it's published some years, I think 50, 70 years before the story of John Smith and Pocahontas becomes famous. So there's speculation that John Smith uh, read this story and maybe invented something similar. Um, and that became the story of Pocahontas. So our own little slice of American history here, we're gonna walk up on the mound and back down the other side before we go to our last location, which is another princess story, uh, lots of princesses in the pink streets. And I'll get Andrew to just sort of film around. You can see the shells on the ground. The city's done a really nice job of, you know, putting in steps so you can get up to the top. You can see the house immediately to the, I guess that would be the east 
part of the mound was scraped in the 1920s when that house was built. And it's believed the mound was probably originally about 10 feet higher than it is today. Um, but again, other than that, really still in pretty good shape. We're gonna be going down the back side of the mound. I believe we're allowed to do this because there is a step here. <laughs> so I don't think we're traipsing down anywhere we're not supposed to be. One of our uh, viewers, Lindsay Harrison, says she remembers riding her oh, yes. bike down. <laughs> That's I say, Lindsay. This is funny. <laughs> Lindsay is the parent of a, a child at my kid's school. And she texted today and said, I live two houses down from that. In, actually, I'm just about to tell the story of the, the next house we're about to tell the story of. There's two kind of, um, there's a debate about what is the oldest house in the Pink Street. And one of them is the house that Lindsay grew up in. And the other is the house that we're about to finish our tour at, which is known as the Argento Castle. Personally, I kind of think Lindsay has the claim, Lindsay's house has a claim to it because even though the Argento Castle was started in 1920, um, it wasn't finished until 1925. And the house that Lindsay grew up in, um, and then maybe even 1926, was built before that. So that was known as the Newton House. And it's just two houses over from here. So I think they win. John, go ahead and put up the pictures. We're gonna walk, we're gonna try and walk fast down to our last stop, the Argento Castle. Yeah. Um, I've go got ahead and put the princess up there, yeah. Okay, let me find, I gotta say all the princesses' names so I have to find my notes to get all her names correct. Now, like I said, I think this neighborhood may be one of the more intriguing um, in <laughs> I gotta tell you, I know you got all into the tiger's story. I got really deep in the weeds on the princess story. Um, I, I think actually, you could write, her, write a book on her. <laughs> the last slide is um, a link to a really interesting blog that has all kinds of information on this woman. So her name was Princess de Montglion, Rosalie, Francois, Adelaide, Caroline, Eugenie, Marie Argento, Countess de Mercy Argento. Whew. I'm going to call her Rose. Rose was the last member of the one of the oldest royal lines of Belgium. In fact, she titled the autobiography that she wrote later in life, The Last of a Race. Princess Argento, so the princess title comes from her mother's line. Um, by her father's line, she was a, well, he was a count, so whatever that would make her. Um, she was born in Argento Castle in Belgium. July 18th, 1862. So just a few years before Catherine Bell Tippett, so they're contemporaries. She's the only child of Eugene de Argento and Princess Louise de Caramon Clemet. Her mother had been a favorite mistress of Napoleon III, and her great grandparents had been close confidants and aides to Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. At 20, Rose is pressured into marrying the Marquis de Avaray. Now, a Marquis, when his father dies, he becomes a duke. They get married in a massive wedding attended by the King of Belgium, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, who World War I was started over his assassination, and the Duke of Edinburgh. During this uh, wedding, she's deluged with gifts, priceless gifts, many of which end up in this house we're about to end at, the Argento Castle. Her marriage is very unhappy, and, uh, but it does produce one son, Antoine, but she and her husband divorce and she ends up traveling the world. And she's the toast of Egyptian sheiks, Russian czars, and she becomes known as the Gold Rose of Paris. Eventually, her jet set lifestyle, which included an addiction to opium, took a financial toll on her. And she is also engaged in a bitter custody battle over her son, which some speculate maybe had more to do with the financial settlement she was looking for than it did for love of her son. I think that's sort of an unfair um, criticism because she was crushed when her son later died. Um, he drove race cars and he died in a racing car accident. But she ends up moving to the United States in search of a new life. And she becomes the, she loved animals, much like Catherine Bell Tibbetts. And she begins to breed champion show dogs. And actually she's still famous in these circles for introducing this, I think it's pronounced Sam Samoyed type of dog. Somebody will tell me if I'm saying that wrong. Um, kind of a Russian, white Russian dog. Um, and she becomes famous for breeding these champion dogs. 
so famous, in fact, that, you know, she won so many shows that she actually was accused a number of times of dying her show dogs. And John, you've got that picture up of yeah. when that scandal sort of rocked the show dog world. So she marries and later divorces a lion tamer who then gets eaten or killed by a bear that he's taming. So another name we thought about giving this tour was lions and tigers and bears, oh my, because there's lions and tigers and bears related to this neighborhood. Um, when she ends up buying a house in Tampa and setting up house with her illegitimate brother. So on her father's deathbed, her father confesses to her that he has had an, an illegitimate son and Rose sets, makes it her mission to find him. Her lawyers finally find a man they believe to be her brother. They develop a relationship and they end up spending most of the rest of their lives together. And they become essentially recluses in a house in Tampa. She does, however, befriend a few people and she shows them the jewels and the antiques and all the rare you know, treasures that she has in her house in Tampa. One of these people that she befriends is named Madeline Gill. Rose ends up dying of a stroke very suddenly at the age of 62 and all of her possessions go to her brother. He then ends up dying under pretty mysterious circumstances not long after her. And now all the possessions end up with Madeline Gill, who's the friend of the family, who lives in St. Pete, who then ends up displaying all these possessions in this house that we're walking up to now, which she calls the Argento Castle. Now there's a lot of confusion, I guess I would say, about whether Rose ever had anything to do with this house. Some people say that she had the house commissioned and that rooms in it were built to look like the Argento Castle that she grew up in in Belgium. There's others that say, no, I think it was probably built on spec by the Moroc company, you know, beginning in 1920 as sort of a lead into the development of the Pinellas Point edition. So this is how here, Angie, if you could film that. So Madeline Gill somehow ends up, her ne name is never on a deed, neither is Rose Argento. Um, she ends up, hi, <laughs> this is Odor. We, uh, we saw them the other day and they're doing, I'm just telling them all about the, uh, uh, it's, oh, good. Have you been watching? Oh, good. Okay, cool. Well, we're just wrapping up now. But I was going to tell them about the, uh, so Rose, they, Madeline Gill displays the treasures there for three years and then the museum closes. Belgium actually sues to get these treasures back, the country of Belgium, and loses. So Madeline Gill makes off with all these treasures and they end up all over. There's a really great story about how these worth dresses end up in a, um, thrift store in New York City and get found by Bill Cunningham. It's fascinating, fascinating stuff. So this couple bought the house about five years ago and are now doing a beautiful renovation on it. It has spectacular views. John's going to put up some pictures from um, when it last sold about five years ago. And you can see what spectacular water views it has. In it. Anything you want to say about your lovely home? Sure. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Your view. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and tell me your name again. Kopko. Hi, Lauren. Ed, thank you so much for letting us come out. Now, they probably can't hear you because I have sp a speaker on. Uh oh. No, no, we're just ending. So I think. <laughs> he looks like. Preserving the old house. So I didn't mention that Mayor Al, so that after the house was the Argento Castle Museum, it was bought by Mayor Al Lang, who brought spring training and the famous green benches of St. Pete. He was responsible for making sure all the benches were the same color. He passed what was called the Green Ordinance. He lived in the house for decades and through fabulous parties. Babe Ruth was actually a guest here at a party at this house. And I think it's something when Babe Ruth is sort of the, the lesser known person associated with the house, or the less interesting person, I should say, then uh, what a spectacular no, view. We got water on two sides. Water on two sides. It's completely centered at the, at the bridge. Yeah. So we have a beautiful view of the rest of the bridge. Of the, of the, of the yeah, it's great. And you said to me the other day that you have a pretty high elevation yes, here, too, yes, which so is unusual. 
did our seawall over so and they just redid their seawall he was saying well thank you for letting us come in and take a, a sneak peek good i'm glad you guys enjoyed it so john we're going to be signing off this was kind of a rare treat to get a yeah what a nice this. little ending here to the uh to the show well it's gorgeous and we enjoyed being here so john Isa, we're signing off thank you everybody we'll see you on the next one thanks guys